Well, first of all, I want to thank the Ancestral Health Society for the opportunity to, to talk here. Uh, the title is uh, Are We Carnivore? Uh, not where we carnivores, but in the present tense. So, of course, we are not carnivores running around uh, uh, hunting animals, but uh, the question uh, that I ask is, uh, are we still biolo biologically adapted uh, to be carnivores? So, and then, if we are, what does it mean uh, in terms of protein uh, consumption? What would be uh, ideal, sort of ideal or safe uh, protein consumption for us? But that will come right at the end. First of all, let's see if we are carnivores. Uh, this this uh, chart here is adopted from a paper by Sylvia Smith and colleagues that was published uh, in April, this year in Science. And it shocked me. And I hope that uh, you will also be dutifully shocked. Uh, it uh, describes the increase in body size or body weight uh, in terrestrial animals, ex excluding bats. I don't know why they did that, but anyway. Uh, and they, are, they, are they were really interested in the, in the recent period, relatively speaking, of 126,000 years ago until now and the future. But they were kind enough to provide this data uh, from 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct and uh, the mammals uh, started to become the dominant uh, uh, family. So at the beginning, we, were all, we had only rodents, which weighed maybe 100 grams or so. And uh, as you can see, there is a constant increase in the size of mammals. And this is to be expected if you think about the dinosaurs were so big, uh, and they were there for 120 year, million years or so. So the, the Earth can support big animals. And apparently, it happens uh, as part of, of a larger scheme of evolution. So 62 million years later, you find a group of uh, a large mammals uh, averaging uh, 550 kilos, uh, and that's big. It's big because for that to happen, you have to have quite a few species that weigh much more than 550 to offset the ones that weigh the rodents, for instance. So, so you're talking about, and, and we know that, elephants that weigh about three times the size of elephants uh, today. So huge, huge animals. And, and quite a few, quite a few species. And so if you connect the, the, the 2.5, that's the data they give. If you connect the 2.5 million to the 126 million, there's, there's your drop of about 80, over 80%. So because at that time, it was only 100. And this is in Africa. And by the way, Africa, the decline in Africa was uh, higher than the decline in other continents. Although Africa is a big continent, it's not supposed to, to happen in big continents. So we don't know exactly what happened in the, in the meantime, between two and a half and, uh, and point one. But we can guess, uh, uh, because two and a half million is when humans appeared. I'm talking humans, all the homos for me are humans. Uh, Homo habilis, and then Homo erectus. And uh, Homo erectus appeared about 1.8 million years ago. Uh, and 1.5 million years ago, there's a big change in the hyper carnivores guild. Uh, a lot of uh, species disappeared from this guild. And uh, Verdelin and uh, Lewis uh, speculate that this is because humans uh, Homo erectus, in this case, uh, entered the guild. And you see in the sites, uh, in Homo erectus sites, very large animals, elephants and, and, and similar, not similar size, smaller size, but very large uh, size animals, 
with signs that, uh, of hunting. In other words, getting the first access to the animal. Uh, so I think it's quite convincing that, uh, that this decline in size, by the way, today is 10. So you have, you have today uh, an average size which is 2% of the size that uh, the average size that was in two and a half million years ago. Uh, I can't think of any other reason why it would drop like that. So, but this is still an association. Uh, so we have to get to see if we can uh, strengthen the, the evidence uh, with, with some more. Uh, but first of all, excuse me. First of all, I must spend some time discussing another implication of that slide. And this is uh, what it means to all the, for instance, uh, the work of uh, Lorraine Cordain. Because Lorraine Cordain uh, gathered data on hunter-gatherers, recent hunter-gatherers, yeah? And I can tell you that the whole paleoanthropology uh, industry is uh, using these numbers. But as you can see, he was using uh, numbers for groups that were facing animals that on average are 2% of the size of the animals that were in the Paleolithic. So it's just, <laughs> it's just not the same thing. So I think this is uh, uh, misleading. The, the whole, the whole uh, ethnographic record as far as uh, the quantity of, uh, of uh, meat in comparison to, to plants, I think we just forget about it. I'll show you some more, uh, some more uh, uh, data on this. Uh, this is like two papers where they actually don't even take the average of the uh, ethnographic data. They just take one tribe, the Hadza, and use it to justify evolution two and a half million years ago. Uh, anyway, if you look at the Hadza, I read a lot about the Hadza. Uh, if you look at the Hadza, they, they don't even have 10 kilograms average. If you, uh, they, uh, they don't have elephants in their territory. There are no rhinos, there are no hippos. These are animals that they used to hunt before. Now this is, uh, elephants is about a hundred year situation because uh, as you know, in Africa, about a hundred years ago, people started to kill elephants by the thousands to get ivory. So today you can find elephants only in the uh, game reserve. Uh, and this is the situation with the Hadza. And uh, the chart shows the uh, caloric return on uh, hunting larger animals compared to small animals. So hunting a large animal, and this is not the very large animal because this is again uh, ethnographic uh, information. So you're talking large animals is maybe, I don't know, a, a, a buffalo. Uh, so the, the, the caloric return on, on, on time uh, is four times for large animals compared to small animals. And small animals are very close to tubers in the return. So that's, in, in a situation like that, uh, uh, the whole they have to be reorganized. The whole thing has to be reorganized uh, compared to the Paleolithic. And, and they do. Now, a uh, baobab tree is a very important tree for the Hadza. They consume 18% of their calories come from the fruit and the seeds and about 14% come from uh, bees that make their home on these trees. And the reason they use these trees is this is the highest tree in Africa. It's about 30 meters high it can be. So they escape predators of the, of the honey, of course, uh, by being high. So about a third of their non-meat, now they are consuming about 60% non-meat and, and about 40% meat. 
So about half of the non-meat uh, uh, calories come from this tree. Well, it so happened that elephants don't like a uh, baobab tree. And I'll just read you, uh, first of all, about elephants and trees. Uh, it's a small thing. Let me see if I can read that. Uh, Af African bush elephants in Kruger National Park uproot up to 1,500 adult trees per elephant per year. Okay, these guys work. Four a day, adult. And then what happens is that elephant reduce woody species, co species cover by 15 to 95%. So really, and this is the, the name of the paper, elephants create savannas. So when there are no elephants, sorry? So when there are no elephants, the, the landscape changes completely. And it so happens that uh, 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 the picture on the right, I believe, yeah, is, uh, is uh, an elephant finishing off uh, a baobab tree. Uh, they drink the water. They, the, this tree contains a lot of water. And in dry periods, they like to drink the water. So they <laughs> just kill the tree. Uh, game reserves notice that as the elephant uh, population recover, the Baobab pol population decline. So, and tourists li liked uh, Baobab trees, maybe more than elephants, I'm not sure. Uh, so they, they got the researchers to look into it. And they, they, if you read the paper, they call elephants, they call Baobab predators. This is the name they assigned to elephants. So just imagine a situation where the Hadza don't have these Baobab trees, but have elephants and rhinos and, uh, and uh, other large animals, and I leave you to, to guess what, you know, to think, what, how, the, how would their diet look like? So forget about this, all this information about uh, its irrelevance. So if we want to know what people ate, archaeology is the place. And the answer is very short about everything. Everything edible. So seeds and uh, tubers and fruits and, uh, and, and of course everything that's, that's, that's alive. But uh, this is not really interesting for our uh, uh, question. The more interesting is what is the relation between the food, the, the animal food and the plant food. And unfortunately, I spent about six years reading thousands of papers in archaeology, and the answer is not there. Uh, there's one that I have to uh, uh, give that is directly archaeology can supply some answers, and this is the accumulation of, of uh, nitrogen uh, isotope 15 uh, that gets accumulated as the trophic level uh, go up, uh, so carnivores have more of, of it than herbivores. And what you do is you come to a site and you try to get collagen from the, from the human remains, from the carnivores in the area, from the herbivores in the area, and measure the, the isotope 15. And uh, in all these cases, humans have the same amount as uh, carnivores. So some cases even higher, but there's some, anyway. Uh, the objection that other researchers has to it is that still uh, they could have eaten about 50% of plants. They don't register so much because plants don't have a lot of uh, protein. What I think they forget is that this protein comes with fat. So if it's an animal that has 50% protein and 50% fat, there's not much room left for, uh, for plants. Anyway, this is what it is. And... So after spending so many years in archaeology, I came to the conclusion that actually the answer uh, is in uh, biology. And I'm not a biologist, uh, so my interpretations are open to uh, you know, debate, like any other interpretation. I ran it by 
uh, a biologist, Rafi Sirt, if you know. Uh, some people know him. Uh, and, you know, but all the responsibility, of course, was mine. Uh, so I started to look for, for uh, papers that uh, will give me some information about the level of carnivory from our own body. So you have genes, you have metabolism, you have uh, morphology, uh, pathology. Uh, I, th I believe that I just scratched the surface. There are many more uh, pieces of evidence that uh, are, will be found in the future, I'm sure. So here's the first one. Most of you know it, I think. Uh, this is the structure of the stomach. Uh, our uh, our uh, large intestine is uh, 70 percent, 70 percent shorter than if we had a uh, chimpanzee our size, and the uh, small intestines are longer. So this structure is is really an adaptation in the direction of carnivore, and it's very significant because. Another question we can ask, but, but the same, really rephrase the question of carnivory, is how specialized we are. It wa was our evolution towards specialization? Because nobody thinks that we are specialized to consume plants. So specialization in humans is, if you find sign of specialization, it means specialization towards carnivory. And specialization is evident in food when you, your adaptation is actually preventing you from getting another type of food. Because you can have adaptations they don't. Uh, let's say adaptation to running, which I will show later. Yeah, you can run, get more animals, but still doesn't hurt, doesn't interrupt your uh, ability to, to obtain uh, plants. But this one actually is very, very indicative because there are very few plants without uh, a lot of fiber in, in the wild. So it immediately reduces the caloric uh, exploitation that you can make for plants by a very significant amount. So uh, uh, I think this is quite, a, quite an indicator. Ah, by the way, the, the, the skull on the top uh, is there to show that this adaptation was already uh, uh, happening in uh, Homo erectus. And you can see it because uh, the size of the mandible and the size and the shape of the teeth. The mastication system prepares the food for the gut. So if, if it's smaller, then the food is more uh, uh, concentrated. Okay? Uh, it's not fibrous. Fibrous demands different type of flat, flat teeth to grind it. Anyway, uh, this adaptation was already there, apparently, uh, with the Homo erectus. Another type that is, I think, also quite well known is the adaptation to running uh, that the Bum Brumble and the Lieberman uh, uh, found. Of course, you don't run to get plants. They don't escape. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, and also... Uh, so they, they, they think it's an adaptation type of uh, hunting that's called endurance hunting. It's uh, debatable because endurance hunting demand, demand very special conditions, uh, type of soil that you can see the tracks, etc., etc. Uh, uh, it exists. People do it. But whether it was really the main method of hunting, I'm not sure. But it also adapts us to walking. And walking, efficient walking is very important for a predator, for a carnivore, because the home range of carnivores is much higher than that of omnivores. So you have to deal with a larger home range. So uh, here's another one. Uh, another one that uh, uh, I think is quite known is this shoulder, the adaptation of shoulder. If you, if you ask, a, if you get a chimpanzee to throw a stone, he will throw it like five meters. 10 meters. He just his, his, his hands are built to climb trees and not to throw, to throw something. So we are adapted to throwing. 
this is the, uh, the whole shoulder is, is adapted and the, there are changes, uh, serious changes in, in the shoulder to allow us to throw. And this in a way is also an indication of a specialization because this adaptation uh, prevents us from climbing, tr not prevents totally, but uh, is <laughs> interrupting us in climbing trees. So forget about the foot. Uh, another adaptation. I hope I won't bore you with too many adaptations. I just get, I'm just giving part of them here. Uh, the rest are in my uh, PhD thesis. So uh, another adaptation, and this is this adaptation, in my opinion, can be also interpreted. Uh, uh, as a consumption, as an adaptation for consumption of large prey specifically. Uh, we have about three times to four or five times the amount of fat uh, 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 compared to chimpanzees. And uh, we are lucky in the sense that uh, carrying fat doesn't reduce our fitness in hunting and in escaping, because we don't escape. We'll never ever run uh, faster than a predator, and uh, or fa or faster than a, than a prey, so we don't we don't use fast in f fastness no speed. Uh, so it allows us to carry larger uh, uh, reserves. A Hadza hunter gatherer, when when you measure his uh, daily expenditure, uh, energet energetic expenditure, and divided by the by the amount of fat that he has, uh, can live about three weeks without eating. A woman can live double that amount. The, you w we women have uh, more fat uh, than men. So three weeks is actually, in my opinion, is adaptation to uh, hunting of animals that are scarcer than, than smaller animals. In other words, larger animals, okay, are less abundant. This is a law of nature. And uh, so to get large animals, probably the intervals between the hunting is, is higher. So this is an adaptation to that uh, as far as I'm concerned. The next one also is quite known. Uh, I will be very quick with it. You can spend some time on it. Uh, apparently, the number of copies of the salivary amylase gene, ME1, uh, changes uh, in societies, or it's high in societies that consume starch and is lower in, co in societies that don't consume starch. Uh, chimpanzees have two copies, and we range from two to 16 copies. And this allows a starch consumer to release the amylase enzyme and, and degrade uh, the starch to, to sugar and announcing to the, to the pancreas that sugar is coming. Uh, the, the mere fact that we have this uh, range actually points to, to, to a situation where it's not fixed. So normally genes that are there for, for s a lot of time get fixed. A and so it may, be, it may point to the, the situation where it's a very short uh, term adaptation. Uh, another genetic adaptation is to the consumption of tubers. And only groups that consume a lot of tubers have this adaptation. Uh, it ad it's adapt you to uh, detoxify glycosides, and it adapts you to uh, synthesize uh, folic acid, which tubers are very poor. Uh, so, and by the way, this is uh, <laughs> this is more uh, uh, important than you think because if you look at the papers of most of the people who support a high plant diet during uh, the Paleolithic, they rely on tubers. They think this is what they ate because tubers are uh, not toxic. Tubers uh, can be found uh, throughout the year. Tubers, are blah blah blah, uh, uh, but. But uh, apparently, we're not adapted to, to eat it. 
And by the way, the Hadza themselves don't consume a lot of tubers. For them, it's the less preferable food, tubers. They like best honey and then meat, and then uh, I think this baobab did this. Okay, now from pa paleo, from uh, pathology. pathology. Uh, these are, of course, uh, cavities uh, from caries. And uh, the earliest finding of this uh, situation is in Morocco 15,000 years ago. So it means to me that there was no high starch consumption uh, before that because there are these cavities are associated with high starch consumption. Uh, uh, in this case, it was acorn. Uh, you can see on the right, these are the teeth and, and mandible of the recent uh, Homo sapiens from Morocco 300,000 years ago. Look at the perfect teeth. And this is what you find in many teeth. There are quite a few teeth because teeth preserve much better than bones. So there are thousands of teeth that were found in archaeological sites, and most of them are perfect. OK. Now, come three adaptations that I love the most, because I don't have to interpret a lot. Uh, what, what the researchers did in, three in, in all three is dividing uh, this phenomena into groups. So carnivores have this type, and omnivores have that type. And what do you know? Humans fall always into the carnivore group. The first one is uh, age at weaning. We wean at two, two and a half years, and, uh, and the chimpanzee wean at five to seven years. So carnivores wean early. And this is not surprising because carnivores win to a food that is very similar to the milk, to the mother milk. You have protein and, and you have uh, fat. So, and, uh, but but uh, primates win them to consume starch, and uh, not starch, but, but uh, fiber and, and sugars, uh, completely different uh, diet. So they have to take much more time to adapt to it. So as I said, humans fall right into the carnivore group, and this is what the researchers, uh, Pesuni uh, and colleagues, write. Our findings highlight the emergency of carnivory as a process fundamentally determining human evolution. Okay? Music to my ears. Confirmation bias. Uh, Another one that's something that you will never expect or even bother to check is the number and size of the fat cells. It turns out that carnivores have a higher number of smaller fat cells to contain the same amount of fat. And omnivores have a lower number of larger fat cells. By the way, herbivores have also a carnivore pattern because they eat fat, actually, in the end. What they get, what they feed us is, is uh, short-chain fatty acids. So, uh, so there you have it. And this is what's done in, in uh, and humans, uh, by the way, have the highest number and the smallest cells. So very square, what? <laughs> <laughs> very squarely in the, in the predator. So I have to go uh, fast. So, uh, but I like to read it. That's another mu uh, music. Humans are adopted to a diet in which lipids and proteins rather than carbohydrates make a major contribution to the energy supply. Okay, so again, okay, we'll be quick. Uh, stomach acidity. Stomach acidity is also indicative of whether you are carnivore or, or herbivore or omnivore because carnivores have to deal with a higher level of, acid of, uh, of uh, pathogens. And the scavengers, of course, I even higher level. So where are we? We, are, we, g we had the highest level of acidity among the 50-something animals that were checked. So the conclusion was, uh, of the researchers was that we were maybe more scavengers than we thought. But, uh, but uh, actually, if you look at the humans, are a very special kind of uh, carnivore. 
they take the prey and they sit on it and they take it, they don't leave it where they find it. They take it to a central place and they consume it for days and weeks. Uh, an elephant can last for a month, two months. Uh, large animals can last for weeks, uh, days. So, so it's like a, a sort of uh, uh, scavenging on your prey. And that's why we have a large, high load of pathogens, and that's why it's an adaptation. And this is a very expensive adaptation. To carry, uh, to carry acid, a high acidity in your stomach, first of all, to produce the acidity is very energetic, demanding uh, process. And then you have to line the, the, sto the, st the stomach with that. So it's a very indicative. Boy, this sounds fun. So this is the... Uh, sum summation of, of uh, what I found, including other things that I didn't mention, I found two that uh, could be interpreted, interpreted against carnivory. I, uh, that's uh, debatable completely, but I don't want to go into them. Uh, Twelve that uh, support carnivory, uh, seven that support low plant, like, like this tea situation that doesn't prove carnivory, but it supports low plant. Uh, Eleven plus maybe four that support specialization. And the uh, 10 that supports that all these adaptations were already uh, in Homo erectus. So I have to get quickly to this. Okay, I will just cut this one very short. Humans, and this is going back to archaeology, humans are a very uh, specialized hunter in the sense that they are targeting fat. And you can find it from four different patterns in the prey that you find in their sites. I won't go into it, it's very interesting, but maybe in another lecture. Uh, but they all prove very, very strongly uh, that fat is like a must for them. I just give the last example, the, the last one, which is really crazy, uh, extracting fat from bones. To extract fat from bones in paleolithic situation, you have to dig a hole, cover it with skin, Break the bone into small pieces. This is no, not, a, not an easy job. It demands a lot of energy. And then you get a fire done. You bring stones. They have to be big stones because small stones don't uh, hold to the heat. So you put them in the, in the fire. And then when they're hot, you put them into water. You boil. The wa the, they boil. And you wait. And uh, like I'm sure some of you, at least, uh, I think many of you have actually done already. Uh, and, and the fat flows. Now what happens is these uh, stones break because they go from hot to cold, from cold to hot. So they get, they get broken and then they're, they're useless. So you have to get further, further away from the site to get these large stones. All, the, all of this to get something like 6% of the fat uh, in the animal that is stored in the bone. So this uh, actually happened only, you see it only in the end of the Paleolithic. And in my opinion, it shows that uh, they were very short of fat with the smaller animals, but that's another lecture. So this is the last one. Uh, it's, it's a chart that uh, I'll try to explain. I hope, you, I hope it's, uh, I have time for that. The bottom line, the, bot the, the x-axis, shows the amount of fat caloric terms in the animal. So let's say a, a, an elephant has about 60% of the calories as fat and 40% as protein. A zebra will have about 40% as, as fat and 60% protein. So on the, on the y-axis, you have the percentage of calories that you have to get from non-protein uh, 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 sources. So if plants, carbohydrates and fat from plants, or fat from other animals, which you use, and you use only the fat. Why? Because we are limited in the amount of proteins that we can consume. Uh, the limit is about between 35 and 50 percent of our calories. We don't know. Nobody knows. But there is a limit. It's proven that what, what's called the uh, rabbit starvation, where people that feed on too much protein actually die. So, so let's say you, uh, that the limit is 50%. Uh, 
What it means is that if you, if you catch an animal that's 50% fat and 50% protein, you are at zero. You don't need any supplement from other sources. You got all your calories. But if you get, if you get an animal that's 40% uh, fat and 50% uh, protein, you eat the 50%, but you're still short of fat to complete. Now, this is not 10%, but this is beside the point. It comes up to about 17%. And if you get a small deer, let's say, which is 30% fat, and by the way, I'm not talking about dry periods. Dry periods, these guys don't have more than 10% or 5% fat. Just imagine, it's a nightmare. So, uh, and then you have to complete like 30% from other, uh, other uh, sources. Now, this previous uh, slide where I'll show you that they're so desperate for fat means that they could not get it from plants. If they could get it from plants, they were not so, uh, uh, and th this concentration of fatty animals is energetically expensive. They, they hunt some kind of animals, they don't hunt others. They go around, they encounter an animal, it looks, it doesn't have, it doesn't have fat, they just leave it. So it's very energetically expensive to have this kind of strategy. So it means to me that, uh, that plants were uh, very scarce. They did eat plants. I showed you in, the, in the one of the first sites. But it means to me that they were always on the protein limit. Whatever it was, if it's 35% or if it's 50%, most of the time, I think almost 100% of the time, because meat, protein is not a problem. You can get protein easy. Fat is the problem. And completing the 50%, it's the problem. Uh, so, the conclusion. The conclusion is that we, for about a million and a half year, ate a lot of protein. We ate 35 to 50 percent of our calories from protein. What does it mean for us today? That's an open question. Uh, whether it's actually ideal for us to be on the, on the, on the edge all the time, on the limit? I don't know. But it certainly points to uh, a, a safety. For me, the whole paleo uh, template is a safety template. It's not supposed to point us to the ideal uh, diet. It's supposed to teach us safety in a situation when we don't know a lot about, about the uh, diet. So I'd say it is safe to eat large quantities, double. Today, the, the average consumption is about 15% protein. I think in the States, it's 12%. So we have, it's quite safe to double your, your uh, consumption of protein. I'm talking, 35% uh, comes to about four grams per kilogram body weight. Okay, just remember the RDA is 0.8. So how far are we? Now, another aspect of it is that if you eat protein, you don't eat other things. And of course, the, the benefit depends on what you exclude, because what you include is quite safe. And I'm not talking about all the people that need, you know, the sarcopenia business and everything. So my conclusion is eat more protein. Thank you. I have a nice one for you. I have a nice one. I love elephants. <laughs>